All right, welcome to Slither number 53. Wow, that's a big number. Um, and today I am happily joined uh, by Joanne Stewart and Rebecca Jones. Uh, we're going to talk about something that is really significant to me. Um, I, I flipped my class two years ago and uh, got a lot of interesting comments about how doing that was lazy and I didn't I didn't sell things very well. Um, so... I'm here to learn, so I'm going to shut up now and turn it over to Rebecca and Joanne to educate us all. Okay, great. Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for, for joining us. Um, we're thrilled to be here. Uh, we are going to make sure I can change my slides. There we go. Um, here's what we are going to talk about um, for a little bit, and then we will have lots of time and we have some um, discussion questions that we can talk about, hopefully, um, towards the end. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about our personal context, and that means basically where we are and what we've taught, our experience, um, things that have worked and things that haven't, and then uh, our suggestions for what you might consider trying in the future. So some things that have worked for us and some things um, that might be applicable uh, to your classroom and to your future classes. So I'm Rebecca. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm Joanne I'm Mason. And here's Joanne. <laughs> And I think I think you're first, Joanne, to talk about hope. So tell us about hope. Yeah, so I teach at Hope College and I've been here about 35 years. Uh, we're in a small town in Western Michigan. Holland, Michigan is a uh, Dutch immigrant tourist tourist town. It's right on the shores of Lake Michigan and it's a, uh, it's kind of fun living in a tourist destination. Uh, Hope is a residential liberal arts college. We are back at about 30. Our enrollment goes up and down a little bit, but we're at around 3,200 for this fall. Uh, the sciences have always been research active for about 100 years. So um, undergraduate research is, is not a new thing here by any stretch. And um, we have students doing research all across campus. But in chemistry in particular, we have about 100 students doing research full time in the summer. So it's a, it's a fun hop in place in the summertime. And then uh, this will come up later when Rebecca joins in, but yeah, we were ranked least diverse college in the Midwest. Uh, and that's probably pretty true. It's partly due to the Dutch roots, um, but it is certainly something we are working hard to change. Okay, and my story, I'm coming to you all from George Mason University um, and jumping down to that last bullet to piggyback off what Joanne said. We are one of the most diverse universities in the country and we are the most diverse university in the state of Virginia as well as the largest public research university in the state of Virginia. Uh, we just capped over 38,000 students last year uh, and we have students from 130 different countries in all 50 states. And I don't need to read all of the rest of that. Um, it's pretty, just some more random information about where I'm coming to y'all from. Um, we are a young university um, and just celebrated our 50th birthday as an independent university last year. And um, originally we were a branch from University of Virginia. And I wanted to throw, the one thing we do share as I was looking uh looking at this earlier, um, is that neither of our institutions are um, highly selective institutions. So we both accept around 90% of applicants. And what that means for those of you from more highly selective places um, is that we have just this incredible range of students from students with sort of basic uh, issues with reading and writing up through freaky genius kids kind of stuff and everything in between. And so that's part of, that's our audience when we're teaching. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool. So um, we'll share a little bit about our experience with teaching. And I think, Joanne, you're up first. Oh, so uh, I'm an inorganic chemist. And uh, so it's my, my, my favoriteest class to teach. And I'll get to teach that next spring. I haven't taught it for a few years. Um, this fall, I'm teaching Accelerated Gen Chem, which is a one semester course. And so the things I'll be talking about today um, apply to both when I teach, and I teach general chemistry, our, the full year course, 
all the time as well. So those are my the main thing that I do. I've taught a lot of gen ed classes, which are here at Hope are really fun. So I've taught one on abrupt climate change that is a, a gen and science course. And we do first year seminars and I've done those on time and how students use their time. And then we do have smaller classes. Our, we typically cap our gen chem and accelerated gen chem enrollment at 50. I think I'll have about 40 in accelerated gen chem this fall and inorganics anywhere from 20 to 40. Um, and our labs are usually capped at around 20. And my experience, uh, I'm also an inorganic chemist, which means I also teach lots of gen chem. I teach inorganic every fall. I teach a version of it called bioinorganic, which is for the students who have our biochemistry concentration. Um, but I do teach them about 10 weeks of very traditional inorganic curricula so that we can apply it to really cool biological systems like our hemoglobin and the oxygen evolving complex and things like that. Um, I've also get to teach some fun interdisciplinary seminars. Those have been for both first year students as well as for seniors. Um, we do have a graduate program in chemistry, so I teach uh, a couple of graduate courses too. And our class sizes, the ones that I have had, have ranged from as small as five to as large as 20 or 200. Um, they Our inorganic is typically around 30 to 40 every fall. Um, and I started out doing traditional lectures and, as well as labs, but now I've moved to a more hybrid um, and flipped format with lots of active learning. Um, and so we'll, that I think is some of why when I saw Joanne's post about this um, opportunity to, to talk today, I thought, well, yeah, I have some things I could share that have, that have worked and, and that maybe um, other folks could benefit from. So we, uh, when we were putting this presentation together, we uh, chose this metaphor of a school bus <laughs> because we wanted to think about how, or I was thinking about how learning is a process. So what is the alternative pedagogy bus and why do we want students to get on this bus? Well, learning is a process, right? Just like traveling. And sometimes the journey is more often Im more important than the destination. And Really, any teaching or classroom activity that's rooted in educational research could be considered or could be considered a part of this ped alternative pedagogy bus. So really any lots of different options between um, having discussion in class to doing Pogol to doing full flipped classrooms to doing hybrid uh, anything that is not standing up at the front of the room and talking uh, is basically what we're talking about. And we would posit that our suggestions would apply in all those other cases. And there are, like I said, lots of possible routes that this that this bus might take. Um, my class this fall is uh, fully flipped. And when I asked them yesterday, how many of you have been in a flipped class before? Half of the students raised their hands, wow. which was incredible. <laughs> I was thrilled. Um, but I was also very surprised because, uh, you know, five years ago, most students would have no clue what that even is. So I was thrilled that so many of them were familiar with them. So Joanne, this is now to you. Yeah. So, um, so we, we're just going to now go kind of quickly through a series of suggestions Many of these people will be familiar with you and, and will be things that you're probably already doing. Um, but from my perspective, the idea is that there's there's sort of no magic bullet, but that this is something sort of engaging students, getting students on board um, and trying to, you know, integrate, connect with those students um, is something that I work on almost every day in class uh, and and I, I just kind of have to keep coming back to this. So I hope that's one of the take homes today is that hopefully we'll give you a variety of suggestions and um, if you kind of just keep at it uh, and uh, there's, since there's no really one magic thing to do. So, um, all right, so we've got a few to talk about here. Uh, I was telling the truth. Uh, so there is research that shows that um, small group work and active learning is is sort of but for students it's felt to be more difficult it's harder than what uh, listening to a lecture is it's harder work um, but also they learn more 
And so um, I'm very, I share in the very beginning of the class. So I do a lot of uh, active learning, a lot of small group work. I do sort of usually a mini lecture followed by uh, student activities. So usually often working on sort of problems that are linked to real world situations. And so uh, I share this, this research article with them and I say, hey, if I give a beautiful lecture, you're going to walk out of class feeling great. Um, and unfortunately, you won't have learned very much. And if I give if we do active learning and you struggle and you can't get it and you you know make mistakes and you go back and you try again and stuff, you're going to walk out of the classroom feeling like you've learned less. Um, but this research and there's more than just this one paper clearly shows that there's more learning that has happened and so uh, kind of getting at the emotional side of learning there with students um, and so I and then I revisit this multiple times throughout the semester next one I do almost in all my classes my intro courses and my upper level classes now I do something on mine some sort of a mindset activity the one that I use in Gen Chem there's a link here and and we'll get these slides up later um, and so we talk about mindset. So this is this idea of fixed versus growth mindset. Uh, fixed mindset says, I don't, I, you know, I don't do math. And a growth mindset says I can learn math. And, uh, we make a lot of, you know, sports analogies and learning music analogies. So if you're training for a marathon, a stroll out to the mailbox is probably not going to suffice for training for that marathon. So just doing doing the easy thing um, is not necessarily going to help you learn all that you need to learn. And, you know, we talk about the fact that learning is hard work. You need to make mistakes, et cetera. And then I also structure my class so that students have opportunities to drop grades, make mistakes along the way without it uh, hurting their overall grade in the course. So I try to build in these mindset activities. Then we come back. So they do some reading, they write a short reflection, we talk about it. And then we revisit this multiple times throughout the semester talking about, hey, was this really hard? Well, you know, just think what a, it was a great op opportunity for growth. We're gonna, we're gonna, we can do this together and, and sort of we're gonna move on from there. So the third one, um, is I because I do so much small group work, I do not assume that my students know how to do small group work. I, I can tell you that my my colleagues don't necessarily know how to do small group work. And so I use, uh, uh, especially at the beginning of the semester, I use these very prescriptive roles for people. And so um, often in my intro courses, I will, I use kind of a combination of groups that are set. So they're seeing the same students in their group all, all, each time. And I do some spontaneous grouping as well. And so um, um, often I, I sort of have borrowed some of this from Pogel and I, I sort of emphasize these, these uh, role, group roles uh, to, to do this really for fun. So each group will have a, a group facilitator who keeps them on task um, and a note taker. And um, there might be somebody who perhaps is like a synthesizer who can periodically say, so what I'm hearing is, and repeat it back to the group again so they can all come to uh, agreement on that and make sure things are clear. And then the a student's favorite role is there's always a group encourager. And that's the person who periodically shouts out, wow, that's a great idea. I wish I had thought of that. Um, and so if I'm, I'm walking around the room and not hearing much encouragement, um, I will prompt for that. And the students sort of all collectively across the whole room will shout out, wow, that was a great idea. Um, and there's a lot of laughter and, and we go from there. Um, so I found that to be really helpful if students know exactly what the, these sort of positive roles that they can play in a group. All right, awesome. And I'm going to share a few more suggestions. This one definitely connects to things that Joanne have our, has already said, um, and that in my classes, when we're doing um, difficult subjects like MO theory or symmetry, we I explicitly talk about how learning is difficult, um, and we normalize. I normalize the struggle. Um, I also tell my class more than once that they need to interact with an idea five to seven times before they learn it. And that's a lot of different times that you need to actually encounter an idea. And sometimes that's not enough. Um, sometimes you need more than that. So 
recognizing that learning is difficult and normalizing that struggle, like what Joanne said, is I think definitely a part of helping students accept and be more willing to try some of these alternative pedagogies. Um, again, like being active in class or getting up and using the whiteboard. Um, some students are very shy about that, but when they realize, oh, it actually doesn't matter if I make a mistake, that that's okay, that's an opportunity to learn, then, uh, and there's no stakes essentially riding on it, they're more willing to try. And I feel like that is, that is a, a huge, that has really lowered the activation energy to getting this, um, them to be more engaged. So I also do some really regular reflections, which this also echoed some of what uh, Joanne said, um, in that I have my students, after they've watched a video, in fact, tomorrow when I go into class, after they've watched my first few mini lectures, I'm going to ask them to think about what was familiar in the videos and what was new, and then for them to tell me what those things were and to talk to each other about it. So I regularly create this kind of space for both conversation as well as reflective processing about what they're learning. And there's been lots written about how valuable reflection is. And I don't think we do enough of it. We need to do it a lot more in the sciences. The humanities folks seem to do this way better um, and than most scientists that I know. So I try to incorporate this a lot. And I think it's really valuable um, and it again, it helps create space for us to talk about the content as well as how we're actually learning uh, and the processes that we're going through. And then the last part, the last I'm interrupt there just real quick. Oh, yeah. So Go ahead. research has shown that when you're doing group, when students are doing group work, that if you put in some reflection processing in that, they will get better. It helps them get better or better faster at doing group work because they really their skills really do improve as the semester goes on. So something as simple as two questions, you know, what did your group have the have them do it together at the end of the of the activity or whatever? What did your group do well together? What could your group do and improve or do better next time? Um, and so I will sometimes build that into group work. Oh, great, great thought. Thank you. So the last, the last point I wanted to share is that so much of what uh, is happening in our classes and how successful it is has a lot to do with the attitude that we bring as the instructor. And so be encouraging and setting a positive tone for the class and consistently doing that is something that I have found makes a huge difference when it comes to getting students willing to, to be on that bus with me uh, and to be trying something new. Um, by saying we're we're learning about how we're learning uh, and explicitly talk, talking about that and that that's a good thing uh, and that can be fun is, is something that um, I can do that. That's a part that I can control. I can't control my students who don't want to be in class at 9 a.m. That that happens <laughs> um, every semester. That's a challenge. Um, it is early, and some of my students are not going to be that awake. Um, but I think rather than being critical of that, I'm just glad they're there, and we make the best of it. So having that positive um, tone in class is... Um, it's definitely been helpful to helping students in my classes um, be engaged in these different pedagogies. All right, we have a few other thoughts. Uh, I think I think we're gonna split this slide, right? Yeah, Jenna? I'll do the first okay. one here. So the first one says recognize alternative learning outcomes. So what that means is in our uh, Gen Chem course, we have a list of student learning outcomes for that class. One of them is uh, work effectively in a group. And so I will periodically throughout the class pull up the learning outcomes again and say, we're doing this because the chemistry department and Hope College thinks this is important. And so it's one of the, the outcomes for the, the goals for this course or outcomes. Um, and so it's not just that you're learning how to do PV equals NRT, but you also are learning how to work in a group. And that's, a, that's an important skill. I will talk with them about um, how do you how do you put that in your resume? How do you talk about the fact that because you've learned these roles on how to if, if um, and I throw the roles out partway through the semester because they just sort of start to do them more organically. Um, they they you know they're learning things like how do you how do you lead in a group? 
How do you listen in a group? And they talk, can talk about listening skills, doing the synthesis of what you're hearing in the group and being encouraging. And so, so those are things that they can actually put in their resume if they want. Like, these are the skills that I have in teamwork. They can talk about being a good team player, et cetera. And we talk about that in class. Also, um, another goal that we have in Gen Chem is um, that students can describe how chemistry connects to, to their own lives and to the real world, if you will. And so a lot of the active learning that I do is things that connect chemistry to their lives and to the real world. And so periodically I say, not only are we learning this great chemistry stuff, um, but we're, we're achieving this one um, outcome for the course. Another idea that is relevant to this conversation mm -hmm. is that there is gonna be resistance. And so recognizing that and uh, to some degree honoring that we're going to have students who are not willing or readily going to jump into some of these um, alternative um, classroom environments is is part of what I think is what make, can make it healthy for us, right? It's just honoring the fact that some of them are going to be resistant to this and it probably will not be smooth sailing or it will be a bumpy bus ride the first few times you do it. Um, but over time, it can lead to interactions that are totally different than what you would have had in a traditional lecture. And personally, I have found those interactions to be so rich and energizing that I can't imagine ever going back to a traditional lecture format. I still do some like mini lectures, um, but I enjoy so much more uh, doing active problem solving and discussion um, and then answering questions and really, really thinking about ideas in a deeper way than if I were using all of the class time that I have for lecture. I really like how a lot of these alternative pedagogies that we talked about at the beginning are uh, designed to help us engage students in different ways. And I don't really wanna go back to being the only one that's talking in the room. So um, I really love um, hearing what they think. And I think that um, it's a great way of modeling how science is done and how learning on the research level is actually done too. But that is difficult. Just like research is hard, resistance to some of these um, research-based practices in our classroom is also going to be a reality. And then perhaps this is this one might be obvious since this is an Ionic Viper uh, webinar here, uh, but that is to always to seek community as well. And so Oftentimes your colleagues may be the best folks to go to because they know your, you and, and your colleagues know your students the best. Um, and so your colleagues might have some great ideas about what, what's going on in the student's head. Talk to the students, ask them what they're, what's going on and what the, what's working and not working for them. Work with your Center for Teaching and Learning if you have one. Uh, but best of all, go on the, the Viper Pit Discord if you're not already on there. And uh, so if you go to ionicviper.org, you'll see directions on how to get to the uh, Viper Dis the Pit Vipers Discord site. Um, and boy, not only can you ask for questions and hints and all those kinds of things, you're you're very welcome to to vent any frustrations that you have on that on the site as well. So all is welcome. So yeah, so that was our quick run through um, a few ideas. And uh, so we would like to sort of throw out to the participants here. And uh, I don't know if we want to, yeah, we might be able to perhaps get rid of the screen sharing or not, but let me look at what, let's look at what these questions are first here. So we wanted to throw out a few questions to everyone. And that is sort of what are the challenges that you've experienced? Uh, and, and Rebecca and I are happy to share some of our own challenges. Uh, how do you and your students feel about alternative pedagogies? And hopefully someday we can get rid of that word alternative, but we're working on that. Um, and uh, for you and what you're doing, if you're just flipping your course now, or if you're moving to more, using more literature in your teaching uh, or more group work, whatever, what's the most productive next step in your personal context? And a lot of people, the Viper folks have heard me say this many times before, and that is, you know, one step at a time. So I love that last question there. You know, so what's maybe one thing you can do next semester uh, to to work on this issue? So, so can we maybe un unshare? Absolutely, sure. So yeah, and I'll put those questions and our emails in the chat. All right, and I'm I've got them on 
paper. I'm looking at them here as well. So, so Great. we'd just be curious um, for the folks that are here uh, and uh, Chip included, uh, sort of what what challenges you have experienced with respect to students getting on the bus. I would just share quickly that um, the the evaluation structures um, for faculty are not set up for this. So, for instance, um, we've we've switched over to a couple of different you know formal end of semester evaluations, and they're just you you read them and they're clearly written as though we're as though we're lecturing. Mm -hmm. um, Thankfully, I'm at the point in my career, I don't actually have to read or care about them very much. So I give my own open ended questions that are the things I really want to know. But I mean, I'll, I'll never forget the, the first time the first time I did. I mean, I do some pogo. I think most of you know that um, it came back. We paid X for this course and he didn't teach. You know, and that was, you know, uh, 10, 12 years in my career. I never got that before that it just didn't teach. But that's how it was interpreted. Um, but even among now that I've done more and I'm working with a different cohort, I'm chosen more developed and that kind of thing. Um, when I ask for evaluations about the course, a lot of it does become evaluation of that alternative pedagogy. That is, they either either loved it or hate it. You know that that was. Um, yeah, I don't generally have a big enough N in my my advanced and organic you know statistical to do any sort of real assessment of it but but that is that is i mean for for younger faculty that's tough i don't know that i would advise people to try mm -hmm. something like that when they're young in their career because again the structures are not set up to 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 treat it appropriately i don't know anyway that's that's one obstacle that yeah that's and great. i have found I've, I've gotten fewer of those comments as i've sort of worked harder and harder on these kinds of things that we talked about today, but I, I do still get them. I, I shared this one with Rebecca, one of my favorite one, because I was talking in my, in an upper level class about the importance of reflecting and thinking about thinking. And, uh, you know, Rebecca talked about learning about learning. And I evidently must have used the word metacognition one day in class because on my evaluation, a student wrote, um, you know, she does a lot of stuff that's a waste of time. Like, what is this? What is this crap about metacognition? They said. <laughs> I was like, oh well. So other. I and, wanted and to that, share. Or go I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. Um, I um I wanted to. I, I I hear what you're saying, Joe, and I wanted to respond by saying that. Um, and to share this link about, that I just came across recently, because um, at Mesa, we have been working on trying to figure out how to better assess effectiveness in teaching. And I think this is kind of a persistent problem um, in that we know student evaluations of teaching are profoundly biased against women and uh, people that are not white. And we uh, really do need better ways to assess and reward and encourage better teaching. Um, and at a research university, this is absolutely part of my priority <laughs> is to make have these this be part of the conversation because teaching is absolutely seen as the maybe maybe third on the list of teaching research and service for some people. Um, and it shouldn't be by any means. Um, we serve so many students and we absolutely can't afford to not be thinking about it. Um, but I found um, this particular um, grant or, or this, this site that I just shared, this TVAL um, is Transforming Higher Education Multidimensional Evaluation of Teaching. And there is a, a lot of work that's happening and it's actually very current. Um, it's uh, they're current. These are current NSF awards that are funding it. Um, and some of this is stuff that I've I have seen before, but others, uh, other of it is brand new within the last couple of years. So um, if you're in any position to share this with folks that might have some say, there's some really great rubrics on that site. Um, there's tools that you could do self-reflections um, and there's things that you could potentially incorporate uh, to help uh, explain and help others at your university understand these kind of pedagogies and, that's and how the they project. might be related. That's out of like Kansas and Colorado and and a, and two other schools. 
Yeah, so Michigan is, State um, and and what was the other? There is one other one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I, yeah, I know where I am, where, you know, small college where teaching is supposed to be primary, we've never really effectively evaluated teaching, but we're starting to make, we have a new student evaluation of teaching, which is better, um, but it still has the same problems with bias that all student evaluations of teaching do. And we're going to start to pilot a, a, a peer evaluation system. I'll let you know how it goes. Um, uh, it's something we probably should have should have been doing all along, but really haven't been. And uh, and then the reflection process is part of the <clears throat> always tenure and tenure and promotion packages and stuff. So, yeah. Um, any other challenges, um, Patrick, Chris? Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I I think one of the the biggest pieces I come up to is that buildings that were not built in the last five or so years do not really have the right infrastructure in mm -hmm. place. Um, and I've had now opportunities, I mean, I'm about to start my second year, and I've had opportunities in two different types of buildings and like desks and things like that, where ones that can be move around really easily and put into little pods are so fantastic and they encourage it. They have to look at each other because they're facing each other versus some of the other rooms that are designed just to everything faces the board. Have you have you found anything that helps with those awkward rooms? Uh, I mean, some of the things is I just I'll go in before class to move the desk. I'll, I'll try <laughs> to do that. But then again, you, you've got a big square room with a lot of space versus a very tight room where they have is the exact number to fit into rows. It is more difficult, um, and I think um, I think the worst one I had was more of a gen chem, but it was stadium seating. And I had 20 people in a room meant for 60 and they had positioned themselves in the, all the way around and just like <laughs> trying to limit abilities to sit in certain spots. It's still they're they're trying to maximize their distance from each other at all times. So I, I think that's just one of the big Hans, challenges. Hans rule. <laughs> Hans rule is, is what it's all about, you know. I have a room kind of similar to that for Gen Chem, maybe a little bit bigger with a few more students. And I've, uh, it, it always gets some great looks the first day of class when they start walking in and the first person that sits in the third row, I'm like, no, that's my row. And the sixth row, no, that's my row. Um, and, and they grumble and move, but that's my access to the middle of these rows. Yeah. I, um, I literally, I literally block off the back two rows when I start teaching, I tape them off and, they learn quickly that that's not where they're going to sit. Well, the other thing I, I've found, because again, research shows that with group stuff, being need and need is, is really valuable and really important. And certainly we can't do it in these classrooms. Um, so a couple of things I found one is, is I will definitely do. It's sometimes hard to do three across because then two works and one sits there, whatever. So I try to do a lot of one row talking to the row behind them, which is, very uncomfortable for the students, but it's much better for communication. So sometimes I'll do like two and two, two, two in front and two in back and have them work together that way. Um, and sometimes I have them get up and this only works if there's space. Uh, a few of the groups will just get up and go sit on the floor together somewhere. And, uh, and that, that has been helpful as well, but, oh, those awkward rooms are awful. Well, and I think one of the biggest things that I've recognized that I was pulling from some different other books I was reading, not related to teaching, but um, especially those big ones for myself, at least it's been cutting down the, I mean, the group size to me can only be between three and four. Um, just because as you're saying, if there's more, they go off. If they're pairs, they're mm -hmm. so easy to go off in their own world as well. Um, whether they're fully invested or completely not invested. That's what I noticed. There's an old parent rule that many of you may not know. And that is that one never invites an odd number of children to a birthday party. Um, because they'll end up being people who are left out kind of thing. So I always invite an even number. And it's kind of, the, for me, it's kind of the same way with groups. I do a lot with threes because I'm in a classroom where they sit six in a circle table. And so I'll have three and three work. And then I'll have all six of them talk to each other. But in general, odd numbers are can be dangerous sometimes. It just depends on the setting. So, Well, and I was thinking that sometimes in those large classrooms, 
even just having them do like pairing up and talking with somebody else, um, especially if the class is like really not configured to facilitate like a larger group, just having them talk to each other is already going to be, and sometimes if you only have a few minutes, that's actually enough because then they're both gonna get a chance to talk, right? If you have a group of four, you need to allow a whole lot more time for everybody yeah. in that group to contribute to it, right? I mean. But if you have a small problem that they're working on, you know, say turn, you know, pair up with one other person and solve this problem, um, that can be more effective for shorter assignments and in rooms that are really, they do have somebody next to them. So that's like a little bit physically, a little easier for them to engage that person nearby. So our next question was, how do you and your students feel about alternative pedagogies? And I wanted to ask Rebecca, so what was your, so when half of them sort of said they'd been in a flipped class before, was there like groaning and eye rolling or was there like, yeah, we're ready for this? Or what was your, what they, was your they were just like, they were like, yeah, we're re like, we're good. Like we know exactly what you're talking about. And I'm like, I, I was, I was shocked in a good way. Um, And I think this, this is now the, let's see. I, this is now the fourth time I've done this class flipped. So I, the first two years were virtual. And then the second year was, um, or these last two years have been in person. Um, and yeah, they were, they were ready. Um, and it was, it was not a problem. So uh, yeah, I think, I think they're open to it. I, we, we have a, we used to have a slogan at Mason that was innovation is tradition. <laughs> we're only only 50 years old but the idea was that we are willing to try almost anything and our students are like that too which I really love that because I'm forever trying new things myself so we sort of have a culture about that at Mason um, and I feel like that has been an advantage for and, um, as I've been trying these new things and and the flip side which Patrick is aware of so our symbol at Hope College is an anchor <laughs> So I don't think we have a saying like that here, but, but what we do have is students that care very much about one another. And so that I use that. Um, so for example, um, I do, this is a little bit of stereotyping, but I've also found it to be very true with my students. And that is um, when I'm teaching inorganic, where I have students from a broad range of majors often, um, I will, uh, I'll have a few engineers in there. And so if I'm going to do something that's sort of really open-ended as opposed to something that's kind of carefully scaffolded or whatever. If it's really gonna be open-ended where there's not a, necessarily any right answer or whatever. I will always say, oh dear engineers, we're gonna do this now and it's gonna be okay, you know? And my biology majors, they're gonna have the time of their lives doing this. They're gonna have great fun. When we get back tomorrow, I'm gonna to lecture for 15 minutes um, because I know that makes you feel more comfortable and I wanna you know, do that. And so I kind of play this like, this might not be your thing, but I'm gonna get back to your thing. And so our students are so, so open to being like patient with one another. It's like, oh, this is your turn and I'll get my turn next kind of thing. So I, I use that a lot when I teach as well to, I just openly acknowledge I'm doing this thing. This is going to make some of you uncomfortable. Some of you love this. And I know that. And then next we're going to do something different. Um, and they seem to appreciate that. Other thoughts on sort of uh, from other folks here on how your students sort of feel about these pedagogies or how you how you feel about trying new things. Chip. Yeah, I'm trying to. <laughs> I'm trying to think it's I, I certainly think there's some resistance from our students in general, remembering my last time doing this in Gen Chem and I'm doing that on alternate years now. So I you're don't teaching, know. You're teaching Gen Chem alternate years. Is that yeah. What you mean? Yeah. So, um, I'm so not this will sure. be your second, second time, second time. So I'm not sure what to expect. Uh, I'm guessing a little more used to the idea um the students will be and maybe more accepting but they could surprise me and revolt day one um we'll see amandeep did you have anything to add 
I'm sorry, I missed a little bit of conversation for 10 minutes because a student walked in to ask. Uh, we're just talking about that how happens. you or your students feel about alternative pedagogies and how, and some of us were sharing stories of student enthusiasm and student resistance and, and also talking about our own ability to, to try new things. So I, I usually don't touch anything in Gen Chem class because that's a 300 student class. And I usually teach the off semesters and it, it's a challenging class to begin with. And I, I don't touch any alternate pedagogies there, but I do teach quantitative analysis class. And I started incorporating Pogel into it. Uh -huh. I started incorporating Pogel uh, during the pandemic. And the first year I was like, hey, this is Pogel activity. Let's go ahead and do it. And, you know, after about 30 minutes, I realized nobody knew what the hell to do. So, <laughs> so okay, you added a little scaffolding. Yeah. It. <laughs> and so now I, I do like lecture or lecture them before and um, uh, lecture before and then do a Pogel. And I've also tried doing Pogel and then lecturing, which did not work out as well. Um, so, um, in, in, in using these alternate pedagogies, I think, uh, I think I, I have to keep in mind the, 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 the knowledge that students know, like the previous knowledge that they know, and then go ahead and use the appropriate, um, alternate pedagogy. Like I've seen some, and my son is in high school, you know, the teachers just keep passing worksheets, you know, to students and, my son says, oh, the teacher is encouraging active learning, but nobody in the group knows <laughs> what to make of this worksheet. Mm -hmm. So I think that when we are designing these alternate pedagogies, these things should be kept in mind. What is the previous knowledge that the student is coming into this class with and what they can do by themselves and on their own? And what kind of support can be built into that pedagogy? Like yeah, maybe you know, when you're doing a pogel, hint, hint, hint. Yeah. That's, that's so, one of the things that with the literature discussions on the Viper website that are sometimes nice because they'll they're most of them are carefully scaffolded. So it'll have a question that says, you know, look at this figure. What are the axes? You know, what are the mm -hmm. units of yeah? And so that sort of scaffolding that the students need. Rebecca, I sorry to interrupt. Yeah, I was you. I was just gonna offer, and I know um I have flipped a Gen Chem class also, and I will say that my students' pers uh, willingness to do a flipped class in that setting, um, especially it was a Gen Chem for engineers, so it was not for majors. Um, they were very uh, they were different than the ones this 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 week. Um, so I think I totally agree with you, Amandeep, that we, you definitely want to um, lead students into them. And so what I do in that class in order to help onboard them to this, this class is flipped, is I take a significant amount of time the first day and I show them how the Blackboard site is built, how they're going to navigate it, exactly where the videos are. I show them after you watch all the videos, you click this button in Blackboard, Mark Reviewed. And once you've done that, if you've done that for all the videos, then boom, the quiz for the end of the week pops up and you take the easy five question quiz that tells me you watch the video. So I, the first time I did it, I didn't have those videos. And I noticed that when I finally, when I saw the students in class, they had not watched the videos and they were like, <laughs> oh, we're just, we just read the notes. And I'm like, why did you do that? Like you needed to watch the videos. Um, so I built in kind of that check and balance for my classes last year. And I, it made a huge difference. A whole lot more of them were better prepared for class. Um, but I think one of the resistant things that I notice all the time especially with those students. So the ones that I have this semester are all seniors. So they're very, and this is a required class to graduate. So they're very motivated. But those first year students, a lot of them haven't and don't understand what it means to be responsible for their own studying outside of class. So another thing that I provide for them is a sample weekly schedule me Here's too. what you need to do on Monday. Here's what you could do on Tuesday. Like if this that class in Gen Chem only met on Fridays for three hours. So that's the only time it met. One day a week, 
for three wow. hours at a time. I was not going to lecture all three of those hours, but I do a lot of problem solving those three hours and it's fabulous. It works out great, um, but it's also exhausting, but they have to be doing stuff in the week yeah. leading up to that. Right. So I wrote out a schedule. Here's what your week Monday through Sunday could look like. And I say, are you spending enough time? Are you really doing that? And so I try to I do that for my seniors too, because some of them are like not quite sure how to do this. And I figure it wasn't that hard to adapt it and maybe it'll help some of them. Um, but that's another way I try to help bring them into what is it going to take for them to be responsible for their learning in this particular setting? Um, and, and hopefully um, well, people have told me those have been helpful and they realize after the first exam, when they don't do as well, they're like, oh, well, and I asked them, well, were you spending time every day to study that? And they're like, no, I'm like, well, here you go. Like, let me, can I show you the schedule again that I made for you? That might be a way to go at this. Um, and then ultimately it's their responsibility to decide if they're going to do it or not. Um, but I try to show them and give them a whole bunch of different maps so that when they're on the bus, they know where the bus is going and, and they're <laughs> able to, to ride the bus with me nice. and with the class. So you kind so, of, so I, oops, oh, go ahead, Chip. Um, you you kind of touched on some things there. I, I like some inside ideas on uh you you mentioned literature discussions and i've i've posted a few of those and they're fun and easy for me to write because i know what i cover in my class and i know what classes students have taken beforehand gen cam i'm going to have students that scuffle with algebra um to students that really have no business being in the class but they're pre-meds and they they don't want to take something harder because they might not get an A and their lives will be ruined. Yeah. How, how do you, you know, it's easy to deal with that range when you're lecturing because you're just talking to, you know, heads that do nothing. But when you're trying to get them going, what do you do? So, uh, Chip, can I uh, jump in? So, uh, sure. What, um, um, what I noticed coming um, from uh, the spring semester um, uh, was that students are severely lacking in algebra skills. So I have students who uh, test uh, below what they call a 70 on the Alex math. And I started looking at the Alex math because I have nothing else to look at when they're coming into Gen Chem. So I went to the Dean and I said, you know, show me these Alex scores for their math that they take, Alex for math, and let's correlate them to uh, the scores that we are seeing on Gen Chem. So students who are coming in with the Alex score less than 70, they are being placed into algebra classes as well as my Gen Chem classes, and they are the ones that typically underperform a whole lot. So I approached an education researcher um, who's now retired, uh, Diana Mason, and she had come up with a math uh, skill-based test, uh, which she has published in uh, JCAM Ed a couple of times. And uh, she her test correlates to how uh, predicting with 80% accuracy how students will do well in the Gen Chem classes. So um, I started giving this test. This is a math test that they should not use a calculator. So we come to know their logical process. It's just simple multiplication, adding up, you know, exponents and so on, multiplying them. Um, and uh, uh, what I what I found was I give this test now on the first day of class. And on the first day of class, they're shocked to know that they don't know any algebra. And now we established a chemistry clinic, which is a tutoring center just for Gen Chem students. So they started coming into this clinic right from the second day because their system got a shock that they really need to come and get extra help. Otherwise, they will not be successful. That's great. It's really yeah, that's good. a great, I, I think that's that a great solution. When we look at, um, and, and I know we're starting to run late on time now. So when we look at... Um, the the some of the alternative textbooks and, and curricula that are coming out now. Um, some of them are much more uh, sort of predict and explain oriented. So a little more using words, a little bit less using math as well. And so um, that's another thing that some places are starting to do is in that first semester uh, to, to make that first course be more about explain 
um, and less about uh, sort of algorithmic types of problem solving. And uh, I'm not saying that's the answer, but it is what some places have done, so. I, I'll also offer the, I, I my previous university did something similar to that. They actually would shift students down to like a trailer chemistry course for that first semester if they did really poorly on that initial assessment. Um, but I I mean, Chip, to answer or to just today, what I, how I would respond in that situation with Gen Chem students who are really deficient on the math is I give them tons of math resources. Um, and I also <clears throat> try to, whenever I need to, like reteach the math, like I'll actually take even in this flipped format, I will take 10 or 15 minutes and like review how to do logarithms, you know, like forward and reverse logarithms, because we'll run into a situation where we need to do that. Um, and they will have forgotten or, and so they just need a refresher. Some of them just need that refresh. Others that really struggle with it um, are going to need even more background um, and more support, but that's, one strategy that I have um, and just give them lots of resources and then encourage them. I mean, they don't, they don't have to be experts at math. It helps if you're really good at math, but chemistry is the central science for a reason, right? It's not just math and it's not just ideas. It's actually both. Right. right. And yep. that's part of why I love it. And I think that uh, some students hate that about chemistry <laughs> that why are you making me talk about ideas? I just want to do the math. And other people are like, I don't want to do the math. Let me just think about the ideas. But we make them do both at the same time. And, and that's what chemistry is about, at least from my perspective. So uh, we again, it's running a little bit late here on time. So I hope that we've provided a, a few ideas of things to try. Um, as I mentioned before, try one and, and see what you think of it and see if it works for you or not. That's uh, that's a, always a good starting point. And then you've got another year to try another one at some point in time. So Rebecca, would you like to, do you have any kind of concluding comments? Uh, yeah, I just say, you know, I think being committed to trying new pedagogies, this is, uh, we, we innovate a lot in research, right? And we think about being creative in research, but our classrooms are places to be creative too. Um, and that's not always rewarded, but Joe, like the situation you mentioned um, about a younger faculty member, I think it is appropriate to think of our classrooms as other research spaces because we are absolutely trying things and seeing if it works. And if it doesn't work, just like we would move on to a new experiment, move on to a different idea, a different thought and find out what works for you. Well, great. And thank, thank you so much for this opportunity. Oh, <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. thank you both for presenting. That was that was awesome. And thanks to our attendees for for interacting and coming up with some great questions and ideas and thoughts. Um, so with that, we'll uh, wrap it up and just say thanks again. <laughs>